I was shown um, hovering car. Yes, th these vehicles uh, hovering above the ground and the nature re was repaired. The earth was so clean and the air so clean. There was no more fossil fuels pollutions, no more hydrocarbons. Carburants, no, you know, it, it was all, uh, it's like the earth was repaired and healed and nature was happy because everything was about anti-gravity and, and um, zero point energy. Um, I, I saw that. And then um, after the looking glass device, I had a little chat with Haben, the, the commander of the ship. And he said, come on, I'm going to show you something. And he took me to a room on the ship. There were a lot of um, computer, sort of computer machines and with holographic screen. And there were um, people, uh, Proxima Centaurians, working on these screens. And there were blueprints of, could, be, could have been these cars. It could look like, uh, you know, futuristic cars, but all with blue lines, like holographic. And they were working on that. And Haben told me, the, 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 the cars you've seen in 20 years' time, they are actually being mass-produced, a lot of them on the moon, but also somewhere else, um, for when the, the, the Terrans, the Earth people, are ready, this will be implemented uh, massively like, everywhere in one go because everything will be ready. It's been produced now. They're waiting the right moment uh, to implement them. You're listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala, your source for the uncensored truth regarding the human, extraterrestrial, global, and political agenda. Click the like button and subscribe to this channel. And now, here's Dr. Michael Sala. It's my great pleasure to welcome back Elena Danan to Exopolitics Today. Welcome, Elena. Thank you, Michael. I'm very happy to be on your um, show again. <laughs> well, that's an impressive uh, T-shirt you got there. Uh, what, what is that? Uh, Space Force. Space Force. Yes, I'm getting uh, ready. For oh, okay. With the uh, US insignia and everything. Yes. <laughs> that is that is cool. Well, very interesting uh, developments recently, and Space Force is at the center of it. So that's very appropriate what you're wearing. Yes, 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 indeed. <laughs> so I thought it'd be good to um, go back a little bit to uh, your earlier career because, I mean, you worked as an uh, archaeologist in Egypt and yes. just a few days ago you had this remarkable announcement that there was a new tunnel that was found in uh, in the pyramid, in the Great Pyramid, and that uh, because you actually have worked there I'm, I'm just going to put up a, a screen share so that way you can see i mean there, there it is that's the the great pyramids i mean three of them and of course uh you have this new discovery so do you want to kind of like just um explain to the audience exactly what the significance of this discovery is well, it's uh, the first time uh, since the, the, the opening discovery of the, the Pyramid of Cheops that uh, such a thing is found. This uh, first was uh, detected by muon radiography. So the a void was uh, already uh, detected. But then they found this entrance to this tunnel, which goes to 30 meters uh, deep. And uh, very well constructed, two meters uh, large. It's absolutely astounding. Um, the whole world is, you know, hold their breath for that. What it means is that it leads to somewhere. It's not um, a shaft. It's a tunnel where you can walk in. And that's very impressive. And that leads to somewhere in the pyramid. Because when you see all the mass of the pyramid with only the, the, the few we know of uh, uh, three corridors and two rooms, there is way more than that. And the pyramid is connected to an underground labyrinth city, you know, much more ancient. So 
it, it was very interesting uh, for me who have worked in Egypt and especially um, a, a little a short while with Dr. Zahi Hawass um, to, to witness something very interesting that not many could have picked up because I, I, I knew what it was about. There was this announcement and uh, at the feet of the pyramids and this Egyptian official said, oh, the experts have decided uh, that it's a um, discharge um, corridor for uh, the weight of the pyramid uh, and something architectural without no meaning especially. But Zahi Hawass comes after and says, I don't believe that. It's not a discharge uh, corridor. It, it's, it's a real corridor that leads to somewhere and that leads to great discoveries and see in the coming weeks what I, I say. Zahia was knows. He knows what's inside. He's been many times underneath the plateau. He knows it very well. He's been underneath the Sphinx, in the Sphinx, everywhere. He knows if someone knows there, it's him. But every time during the last decades, every time he tried to make an announcement, when he actually made announcements, we found a shaft in the Sphinx, we found tunnels under the Sphinx, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, a week later, every time he was obliged to um, deny publicly what he had said. And I know that that is because there are powers behind archaeological sites in Egypt. And I can say it frankly, it's the Freemasons. They own the sites, main sites in Egypt. Why? Because the sites they own have access to power, to technology that they would really like to, um, to use, you know. So um, that's uh, what I can uh, I can say, um, Michael. Well, that's very important. It gives us a background into discoveries under Egypt's pyramids that this has been suppressed for decades by the Freemasons, and uh, you know this is something that I uh, remember William Tompkins, the Secret uh, Space Program insider he said the same that the freemasons uh, are controlling all of these discoveries and uh, he knew of egypt's discoveries being kind of like uh, being kept secret by the freemasons and also radu cinema in his transylvanian book series saying the same thing and, and of course you directly experienced that but yes. what what makes us or what makes you feel that this announcement and Zawi Hawass saying that, again, something spectacular uh, may be at the end of this tunnel. Well, what makes you think it's different this time around? What do you think's happened? I think it's different this time around because um, besides the fact that we know that the, the Freemasons are losing power and grip on things, uh, that's all supposition from the events. Uh, that intervention of Zayawas gives me hope because he contradicts publicly uh, live the, the Egyptian official. Um, that wouldn't have happened uh, like 10 years ago or a few years ago even. It wouldn't have happened. He wouldn't have done that because he would have faces, faced consequences. So that that makes me believe that something good is going to come out of it that effectively a discovery may be at the end of the tunnel <laughs> but that also comes right after uh, the raven raven rock meetings and my belief that both are links we're going to talk about that i suppose uh, later um the both to my understanding, may be linked because on the 1st of January 2023, just um, uh, two months from now when we are speaking, I received messages from my contact in the Galactic Federation of Worlds and High Commander Ardana. Um, the, at the end of her message to humanity, she said for 2023 that um, 
there would be, as she said, focus on the pyramids. There would be an opening in a pyramid. And it will be linked with a knowledge coming that is related to islands in your oceans. So I thought about Atlantis, probably. Um, so she said that. And at, uh, um, a week later, on the sixth, on the seventh, sort, sorry, of January, the Raven Rocks meetings. I think it's all part of a disclosure plan. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's my feeling. Right. I think it's very important uh, that we understand the kind of signals or the announcements that have been made by your contacts, and and how that kind of prepares us for these kinds of revelations that are that are coming uh, that are coming and and of course you mentioned uh Kaman Adana high commander Adana from the Galactic Federation talking about look, look to your pyramids look to the pyramids or focus on the pyramids and talking about the uh islands in the oceans in relationship to the pyramids and and that that is clearly an allusion to Atlantis. And of yes. course, you know, there have been many, many stories of uh, Atlantean technologies being taken to Egypt and being placed under the pyramids. So it seems that we are on the verge of this information coming out. And, you know, many predicted this, Edgar Casey predicted that, that uh, very, at the end of the uh, 20th century, that the uh, Atlantean information buried in the uh, Hall of Records there under the uh, Sphinx would be revealed, but it never happened. So something has changed. And of course, you mentioned the Freemasons suppressing all of that. They've, they've lost their power. So something has changed. And of course, this takes us to this very important meeting at Raven Rock that, uh, that, you, that you saw through the eyes of Forehand, so just want to remind people of you know exactly what you saw, what how it happened that Thorhan allowed you to see what was unfolding there at Raven Rock. Yes, uh, it was on the seventh of January, six or seven. I can't remember seventh probably. Um, I um, around midday received this uh, communication of of from Thorhan, my contact, and he said he wanted to show me uh, through his eyes. We can do that. We I have an implanted device that allows us to look through each other's eye when we decide to, when he does that remotely. So, okay, he wants to show me something. And he was standing in the Blue Ridge Mountains. He showed me, it was very important that I remember, I really visualize the landscape. The Blue Ridge Mountains were kind of even, were even, not flat, but even, all the, the ridge. And he said, That's, that will allow me to locate the place. And he was at the sorry, the exit of a shaft uh, leading to um, a landing bay for spaceships. Then he showed me, he connected with me briefly when he met with a general. So I thought first it was a five star general because there were five shiny things on his shoulder i saw his shoulder in fact it was four stars and a button and uh, i was uh, a bit misled but because i wasn't focusing on counting the stars it was just you know because um i um i was focusing on the device thorhan was giving to this general and this this general, I identified it off a list of 44 generals that you sent me afterwards. You know, I'm French. I live in Ireland. I know nothing about who's who in the American army, military, you know, and uh, which is even better. Uh, I was more objective to identify him. And uh, there was, I was sure I said to you 98, 99% that could be this, this man. And you told me who he was afterwards. So why Thorhan just had to go hand in hand to meet this person to give him this device? It was a flat, long device. Uh, yes, the, here we go. And with a little um, shiny button, something. And this device, um, I was 
told afterwards by Thoran, it contained new plans for updated plans for disclosure about extraterrestrial um, interactions with humans and um, the secret space program. And there's also uh, blueprints of advanced technologies in it. So this was given to this general and the Earth Alliance. Um, but it was given hand to hand, which is quite unusual because, you know, they can send communications to each other. That means that needed not to be interfered. It was the safest way was hand to hand. Yes, that is a, a really safe way of relaying what was a very important piece of information. I mean, the disclosure plan, obviously you would not want that to fall into the hands of the uh, the, the deep state. And so it had to be personally delivered to General Van Herc, who is the uh, commander of US Northern Command and of NORAD. So that, those are the two commands that are really responsible for all of North America in the event of any kind of an attack. And so he's a very significant four-star general. Now, I mean, you, you say you saw the what was happening within this Raven Rock Mountain complex through the eyes of Thorhan. Did, did you recall or did you hear anything about their conversation? You know, what did Thorhan say as he handed this device over to General Van Herc? Um, I didn't, um, I didn't catch the sound of the, the conversation. I could hear Thorhan talk, talking to him, but it was like muffled, like if I needed not to hear, the sound was muffled, but I, mm -hmm. I, I had the sound, but I didn't catch what Thorhan was saying to him. Do you remember if there were other people in the room? Was it like a crowded room? Was it like a, a kind of national security environment? You know, what, what do you remember about other people mm -hmm. in the room? A lot of military, civilians? And no civilians. Uh, the room was quite dark. It was quite a twilight. Uh, behind, behind the general, behind him on the on his would be on his right. There was a door with um, a little light on on uh, on the top of the door, above the door, like a yellow lamp and bulb, light bulb, um, lighting for the door. But the rest of the room was in kind of penumbra and uh, there were people i know there were men i could feel i don't know why. I, I can i can tell it was men in uh, dark blue uniforms um with a lot of shiny buttons um but of course and, and caps but i i could I, it was like shadows it was really in the the, the shadow couldn't tell more but it was militaries yes uh four six people maybe Okay. Well, you know, we know that that device that he handed over to General Van Herc was containing some kind of disclosure plan. So, you know, that, that takes us to some recent developments, like with um, Donald Trump, uh, the president or the former president, depending on what perspective you take, former or, or current, <laughs> is uh, he gave a speech where he talked about um, new technologies are coming on board, and this involved. He talked about personal vertical takeoff landing craft, which is a, fr a flying car. I mean, he's talking about flying cars and new cities being built all over the United States with all of these amazing new technologies. So, I mean, that speech just kind of came out the last few days. So, do you want to talk a, a little bit about that speech and what you think might be the connection? to this Raven Rock disclosure plan? Yes, uh, well, when I heard about that today, um, well, um, we're on the, the, with the 4th of March as we're recording this today, I, um, I was excited. I went, oh my goodness. And that took me back to December 16, 2022, when I was invited physically on board uh, Metton. Uh, Proxima Century mothership. And on this ship, uh, there is a looking glass device. I tried it for the second time and they showed me Earth in 20 years time. And I straightly made a video about that um, to record the date and the moment. Um, I saw 
I was shown um, hovering car. Yes, these vehicles uh, hovering above the ground and the nature re was repaired. The earth was so clean and the air so clean. There was no more fossil fuels pollutions, no more hydrocarbons. Carburants, no, you know, it, it was all, uh, it's like the earth was repaired and healed and nature was happy because everything was about anti-gravity and, and um, zero point energy. Um, I, I saw that. And then um, after the looking glass device, I had a little chat with Haben, the, the commander of the ship. And he said, come on, I'm gonna show you something. And he took me to a room on the ship. There were a lot of um, compute, sort of computer machines and with holographic screen. And there were um, people, uh, Proxima Centaurians, working on these screens. And there were blueprints of, could, be, could have been these cars. It could look like, uh, you know, futuristic cars, but all with blue lines, like holographic. And they were working on that. And Haben told me, the, the 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 cars you've seen in 20 years time they are actually being mass produced a lot of them on the moon but also somewhere else um for when the the, the terrans the earth people are ready this will be implemented uh, massively like everywhere in one go because everything will be ready it's been produced now <laughs> They're waiting the right moment uh, to implement them. Um, so um, reminded me that. And um, yeah, um, you know, Raven Rock, the updated disclosure plan, new technologies, um, it's all part of the same plan of the, the good star people, as we could call them. Yeah, there does seem to be a really amazing synchronicity here with, uh, you know, th this Donald Trump announcement and th the plan that was handed over to General Van Herp at Raven Rock and um, uh, uh, Alex Collier, our mutual friend. I mean, he did his one of his uh, webinars on Friday, and he said something. Uh, that's Friday, the tw uh, what was it, March the third, uh, yesterday. And and he said something really interesting. He said that that according to the information he got from the Andromedans, that what was seen in the future in terms of Earth's development, like you saw, like the uh, though the, the Proxima Centaurians showed you twenty years into the future. He said that that the Earth Alliance, that the White Hats, the military White Hats, know what the future is. And what they're doing is reverse engineering that. And, and I thought that was really, uh, you know, really quite insightful that if you know what the future is, that li literally all you need to do is to just like reverse engineer that. So, you know, that makes me question, well, is are the contents of that device that Thorhen gave to General Van Herc, just the Galactic Federation, the Andromeda Council kind of putting together their ideas for how to reverse engineer the future so that it so that it happens right now. I think it's very possible because time, um, the, the, the factor of time is part of their science and their everyday life, a, a concept that is very difficult to grasp on Earth with our linear time. But when you're not on Earth, um, it, it's um, it's quite mind blowing. Sometimes difficult to understand the time um, equation uh, is different with them. They use it a lot. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. Well, I thought that's a really kind of very interesting perspective. Yeah. You know, we think of time as this magical kind of technology or mm -hmm. thing that can be altered only through some incredible temporal technologies and but for the, the galactics this is everyday technology i mean like you you mentioned that thorhan actually lives 200 years in the future on the pleiades with his beautiful bride we won't talk about that um and and he and he uh comes to earth just to kind of like do his job with the galactic federation and and then he goes back to black 
back to uh, his home world, and that's two hundred years in the future. So, yeah. yes. So, so yes. I mean, he's like living two timelines. You know, one here he's dealing with events on Earth, but on but he when he goes back home, it's two hundred years in the future, and he's there with his bride. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. That's um, that's how they do. You know, it's the the Galactic Federation of Worlds responded to the the call of the Andromedans. Uh, a little bit more than 300 years in the future to uh, come back in time to change timeline on Earth. So the Galactic Federation, which is a military organization, uh, sent troops there and Thoron was part of, of, of them, you know. Yes, so that that is kind of like very significant so now we we know that the galactics the galactic federation andromeda council m manipulate time they are able to change time or at least understand what's what's coming yes. and reverse engineer events so that the the future timeline is preserved and and i think that was one of the things that we know alex collier told us about the andromedans saying that 300 years in the future, if if action wasn't taken by the different galactic councils and federations now on Earth, that 300 years in the future, there would be a galaxy-wide tyranny. So this is part of the reason why everything is has been focused on Earth and so many galactics are here, uh, have been here to kind of like help preserve the timeline. Um, so so now we, we are on this accelerated well, I don't know if it's accelerated, but certainly we are on this path where at the moment, you know, we're using fossil fuels. We're kind of like, you know, witnessing the deep state playing all its major cards to try and confuse and distract and 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 put the world in, in kind of ca create chaos on the planet. But behind the scenes, uh, the galactics are preparing for this incredible future and all of these advanced technologies are being built right now that it's not going to be like 20 years in 20 years that all these amazing technologies become available they're right they're here right now it's just waiting for the deep state to kind of like uh be defeated and and collapse so uh i know you've been talking about this the last couple of years about all of these advanced technologies being built uh, so do you want to kind of like address that Yes, well, uh, since uh, the moon was taken back in February 2021, taken back by the Earth Alliance from the hands, uh, what, sorry, when I say the Earth Alliance, it's Solar Warden troops with uh, the help of the Galactic Federation of World. It's a co conjoint um, operation. Uh, the moon was liberated from the hands of the Nebu, who were the Orion group, Tall Grays. The Dark Fleet also had um, assets on the moon. Everything was uh, taken off the moon. The moon was liberated. And then the Earth Alliance took possession of the moon. And all the facilities were reused for, since then, building new technologies. There has been, since February 2021, a mass producing of um, med beds and medical technologies, but that's not all. Uh, there is also advanced technologies. It's very handy. You know that the moon is very hollowed. There's a lot of facilities under it. So it's not only under the surface of the moon, it's inside as well. There's a lot of room, a lot of uh, factories in there. They can produce a lot of things, very, very efficient. Uh, I've, yes, I've been talking about that uh, since then. Well, I remember JP, uh, who you've met, and yes. uh, a few others have met, uh, who works with the U.S. Army. He says that he was taken. He went on several moon missions in uh, 2021, and he re he re recalls there being a lot of equipment being taken there, and that they were building a lot of things up there. That that kind of matched 
the information you got about the recent liberation of the moon and that there are a lot of new facilities being built and a lot of uh, uh, mass production of advanced technologies. So that was something that JP was able to confirm. Um, and I, th I thought that was very significant. Yes. So I want to go to this uh, incident that, or series of incidents that that happened in uh, February, from February four to February twelve, and that those were the the shoot downs of the UFOs, and uh, these uh, these shoot downs they all followed, uh, like three of them happened in succession after the big balloon was shot down that is said to belong to China and these three objects were then shot down by NORAD which was the first time in since NORAD's creation in since 1958 that objects had been shot down over the over the US by NORAD uh so that was that was kind of very uh, interesting that you have these UFOs being sighted being shot down by orders of NORAD, of course, it made it dominated uh, the the major airwaves, the mainstream media, for for just over a week. And so, what what do you think was going on with the UFO flyovers or these UFO objects and the shoot downs? Well, what do you think was going on there? Well, uh, my, my first suspicion that there was something that was not as we were made believe it was, it's when suddenly uh, General Glenn Van Herk was on every TV uh, talking about UFOs. And um, he, nobody heard about him before, and except that just a few days before, the week before, maybe, uh, uh, no, sorry, it was the 4th of February, a month before, a month before, I had um, identified him as the Raven Rock meeting with Ron, and suddenly was on TV everywhere. I went, <laughs> wow. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> and uh, talking about UFOs, then also, why UFOs, why not UAP? The officials of the deep state last year told us that we're not saying UFO anymore, we're saying UAP. Why the name was UFO? So there was a hint somewhere that it wasn't the same people uh, organizing something. And then I had this communication from Thoron who told me something I need to tell people. There is absolutely no extraterrestrial behind the building of these crafts, alleged craft that have been allegedly shot down it's all earth made by military and that is that was very important then um slowly little by little i i got very little information on that because it's an operation that is still ongoing re related to disclosure so um it's not good to you know reveal um the enemy is, is watching hi guys um, well, um, uh, Thorhan told me they want, uh, he said, the, he said the, the deep state wants to fake an alien invasion, which won't happen. Well, all my deductions, a little bit of information I had was that the deep state planned an alien, a fake alien invasion. And we know about that, the Project Bluebeam, uh, Werner von Braun has spoke, had spoken about that. We, we Now people know the cat is out of the bag. We know about Project Bluebeam, the holographic fake alien invasion that would uh, scare everyone, that we would comply to a world government, etc. What is the best, I think, what I believe is that the White Hats, the Earth Alliance, and I think the Raven Rock meetings were involved in this. Um, plan to, you know, um, take the ground below the enemy, uh, play as if it was alien invasion, but turning it like it's just failing, then the deep state cannot do their own fake alien invasion. 
like you know um michael you you were the, the 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 first person i heard mentioning i think it was in your last webinar about martial arts martial arts that you take the 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 the, the plan <laughs> the tactic of your enemy and you turn it against them and i think that's what was going on and the few hints that thorhan told me would go in this direction for me yeah, I thought that was uh, very interesting that uh, you, you have the, this series of uh, UFO, uh, UFO incidents and them all being shot down by NORAD, by General Van Herc, the very person that received this disclosure plan uh, from Thorhan. And to me, it did look like uh, the Deep State launched some kind of event some kind of false yes. flag event involving ufos and whatever it was they were planning to do got co-opted by the by the white hats by norad by general van herk so that rather than putting people into fear it actually opened people up to well ufos are here they're real uh we don't know what they are they could be extraterrestrial we don't know and and of course people obsessed over the UFO issue for for over a week, and now it's been um, several weeks after the fact, and and nothing has happened. So you know that makes me suspect that whatever the deep state was planning to do, that you know with that was the initial kind of like salvo of of their fake alien invasion or whatever scenario they had. Uh, but that that was the kind of opening salvo. But things seem to have just been neutralized or. Or, I mean, there are some, some are, are predicting still that there is a fake alien or that there is an alien, a genuine alien invasion or a fake alien invasion, depending on, you know, which source you go to. But some people think that, you know, this is the groundwork has been laid. So the deep state isn't finished yet. They're still going to go forward with their second step. And so that makes me question whether or not this is part of the plan that, Whatever the deep state does, the white hats respond and try and turn that around like in a jiu-jitsu maneuver where you use the opponent's force against them. So in this case, whatever the deep state is planning, the, the white hats will turn that around so that rather than people ending up being frightened and scared, confused, they end up being curious, opened and more enlightened about UFOs. Michael, yeah, if I may say, um, I have been saying that the, the regressive aliens had been kicked out from Earth and the stars, our star system since the, the end of the year 2021. And recently, um, who could you remind me, I forget, who, who is this important person who validated what this is what I said. Um, you remember there was um, an official who said that uh, there were no more extra bad extraterrestrials on Earth that had been kicked out. Remember that? Um, I don't uh, remember who it yes, was. Yes, that was uh, John Peterson from the Arlington Institute. And, and he said that three independent sources confirmed to him that negative extraterrestrials were kicked out of our solar system. And, and what makes John Peterson uh, very significant is, is that he's not part of our community. He's not part of our UFO community. He's a, he's a futurist. He has a think tank in the Washington, D.C. that operates in that Washington, D.C. kind of uh, beltway uh, culture. And, uh, and, and, and his institute was funded by the U.S. Navy to look at future scenarios that would take place on the earth and find out how people would react, how the Navy would respond. So he, he's a very he's a very serious uh, person with uh, funding from the Navy, and he's corroborating exactly what you had said. Yes, I, it was, uh, I was very happy with that. <laughs> so yeah, that that's, that's very important. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it's, you know, before we move on to the next topic, I think I just want to mention that recently, you know, someone I've worked with in the past approached me, um, convinced that there's going to be some kind of a genuine extraterrestrial event. 
um, involving these UFOs that were shot down, that this that this was actually an extraterrestrial event and that was negative. And um, so, you know, this kind of raises this issue that we just talked about, that there are no negative extraterrestrials left in our solar system, that they're being kicked out. So anyone saying that we're about to be attacked by negative extraterrestrials, you know, they're operating out of an old paradigm. You know, maybe their information, whoever is feeding them that information is is giving them some old dated material. Maybe they don't know what really has happened um, because, you know, the deep state lie at every level to their subordinates, to their minions. So, you know, their minions might still believe that, well, you know, our, the, our Draco overlords are still operating in our, you know, still operating here, but you know, that, that these, there's lies uh, that, that are used to manipulate people. So, um, but yeah, I think it's very significant that you know, not only you, but Alex and others have said that, negative extraterrestrials have been forced to leave our solar system and and that was confirmed by john peterson and his independent sources so there's not going to be a negative alien invasion no no you, you wouldn't have all this technology manufactured on the moon if the, the the regressive aliens were still there you know exactly all right, so so now what I want to do is is move on to the to the next uh, topic that I thought was very interesting, and uh, I, I did an interview with uh, JP just um, uh, that that came out a week or so ago, where he talked about um, him going into an underground um, civilization and meeting with uh, these human-looking beings, and that he he met this seven foot tall Nordic looking human. And uh, th this this person's name was Jazit. And he escorted JP and I think there were 10 people in that mission um, down into this underground civilization where they saw a, a big city. And adjacent to that was a Nordic extraterrestrial spaceport. So I thought you had some very interesting information about that article. So do you want to kind of like Tell us what, what, how you responded to that information from JP. Yes, well, watching your video with JP, Michael, I jumped twice on my seat because uh, first, Jacit is um, Era Hell name from planet Era, Taigeta system, Pleiades. And these people, it's uh, Thorhan's race, and they are very tall and exactly the description of the, the, the being that led J JP to this underground base. So uh, I said, yes, I heard this name already. And I know it's from planet Era in the Pleiades. I know, I know that's originally from there. But then this name could be, you know, um, and anyone could wear a Pleiadian name. But then, second thing, um, JP describes a, and they enter a, a, a space where there's a there's there are plants and nature, and there's a very strong smell of, he says vanilla, but he said something a little bit like, that seems like vanilla. So it's like vanilla, but a little bit, bit different. And I I just jumped on my chair because um, in, in 2018, when I was taken back again on board Thorhan's scout ship in 2000, November 2018, um, I had I hadn't seen him for years, so uh, we gave a hug to each other, and he smelled vanilla. But my my reaction was something a little bit like vanilla. Same word, same you know, same impression. Um, and then he explained to me later that uh, a day or so before, a cargo ship had arrived from the Pleiades and he acquired this essence smelling vanilla because on planet Era, it's the like the national flower. It's called Oshksha. It's a red flower and it's it produces vanilla scent, very strong. And the, the planet Era, they, they are very proud of this flower. So takes me back to JP's story. If it was really Era Hell from Era. Um, of course, they would have brought their favorite <laughs> flowers with them if they had to live for a long time underground in this space. That was interesting. 
Yeah, it was very interesting because you know he described this city populated by these Nordic, seven foot tall, Nordic human looking beings, and then you had the the spaceport, and and he kind of said, well, the Nordics. Uh, he he described the city as like okay with these very tall human looking people there and then he said well next to the city is this spaceport that the city that the that the city is working with the spaceport that so i mean are we talking about an ancient underground civilization that's been there for you know tens of thousands of years and that they are working with the the nordics that have a fleet uh, fleets of spacecraft there or are we talking about a, a colony from Era Hell that is there. I mean, what, what do you think that city was? I think it's a colony and it may be very recent, you know, it may be an outpost, an underground base, as the, 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 the Federation had has underground bases uh, a little bit everywhere on the planet. So uh, to my understanding, after JP's description to me, it was an underground um, facility. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, I thought that was very interesting. And 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 by the way, uh, JP also mentioned uh, that when he went, he was taken into this underground, underwater city in the Atlantic Ocean, very close to where the space arc was. He said he went. He was taken down by this submarine, by a, a submarine belonging to the Nordics that he was taken down to the bottom and there and there was kind of like three huge domes with cities underneath not far from the ark and the and the cities were populated by these very tall human looking beings he said that he also he he said that uh, again he smelt vanilla in the in the craft belonging to the to the nordic that this wow. submarine that went down there had vanilla so again Wow. You know, this raises a very interesting possibility. Could that be, um, you know, could that be an ancient Earth colony at the bottom of the ocean? Could this be an offshoot or of of an era hell colony that's been there for a long time or recently? There was an era hell colony in Atlantis, but when there was this old cataclysm, everything got destroyed. So it would be a colony that went back to settle again and build a solid facility on the bottom of the ocean, I suppose. Um, I know the Federation, Galactic Federation of Worlds has uh, three or more, I know about three, three or more facilities in under the Atlantic Ocean. So, and there's one there next there. So maybe that, uh, mm. I don't know more. Okay, well, I want to show you a photograph that JP took of a flying saucer with two Nordics in it in uh, in 2018 when he was living in Orlando, Florida, because he says that when he was in this underground city uh, with the spaceport near it just um, earlier this month, or earlier, sorry, in, in January where he was taken down there, he described seeing hundreds of these craft all lined up at the spaceport and that they were very busy. And he described how they would be revealing themselves over the over the months ahead and the years ahead just to kind of like acclimate people. So I, th I thought I'd show you this because I wanted to see if if you have seen this kind of craft before. So so there so there it is. It is a um, you know, it's a saucer shaped craft, and he says that. He, there was a kind of cockpit area and to the left-hand corner, I mean, it's, it's, it's blurry, but in the left-hand corner, you can just barely make out two figures. And he said that these were Nordics, two Nordics. So, so, you know, this is what makes JP kind of like stand out amongst the crowd of people sharing a lot of information that he's got all these photos that he's taken over the years of these crafts. So have you seen that craft before? Yes, I have. Uh, it actually looks like an Alpha Centaurian uh, scout ship, but um, I've seen I've seen them um, also um, in there's a, there was a landing bay on the Excelsior. The day I was taken to by with Thoran to touch the belly of a scout ship and describe that in one of my books. 
um, there it was a big, big um, hanger bay on board the Excelsior, the mothership of the Federation upstairs. Um, and there were these ones. I saw uh, a lineup of these ones, and they didn't look like the Pleiadian scout ships uh, that Thorhan drives. Now, um, what I was told at the time is that there is a type of uh, scout ship uh, by DNA and races. So the the beautiful profiled two saucer shaped, uh, what we call Pleiadian scout ships that the Federation uh, uses. It's for um, Ahel and Tal uh, DNA. It's for Pleiadian DNA. So this, this group, Earth people cannot pilot them because uh, they don't have. Uh, enough of it. So they have hybrid uh, 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 craft that can be um, piloted by um, Nordic aliens, Pleiadians or uh, who else, and Earth people, because the DNA is very different. So it's different. Um, and this, it was the same. It, it had nearly no, no ridge around, a very, very thin, thin and uh, small. And it was, yeah, like square, flat, round. Um, so it really looks like these ones. So that would be the craft used by the Earth Alliance, um, I suppose, by deduction. Well, th that is very interesting. I mean, because you know, what we have now is a better idea of the types of craft that some involved with the Galactic Federation, I mean, the Era uh, you know, with through this underground base and the spaceport there, that they have a lot of craft there that they're going to fly out. So to raise awareness, to kind of get people used to seeing uh, flying saucer craft, I mean, JP said that this was what he was told, that this this was the plan. So again, it's like, well, there's a plan here, a plan to acclimate people. So this takes us back to General Van Herc and the plan that he was given. So it, so that plan that he was given, maybe that includes what JP uh, witnessed, that this is, this is part of the process, that JP is part of that disclosure initiative because, I mean, he's being allowed to talk. I mean, he's... he's serving currently in the US Army, being taken on these missions, and he's being encouraged to talk about it by his covert superiors. So whatever plan is in existence, I mean, he seems to be a key part of that. Yes, I believe so too. Yes. Well, um, I think now maybe we can go to one of these other really interesting topics that you've you've raised. And I know I recently interviewed Chris O'Connor and uh, he's talking about his involvement or his recollection of uh, the, the Saturn agreements that he recently recalled being involved in these negotiations to hand back uh, Saturn and the moons of Saturn to from the Anunnaki to the Earth Alliance. So you want to tell us all about uh, the Saturn agreements? Yeah, so, well, you know, um, as uh, many people know, I am in contact with Ia, who uh, is also known as Enki. And he, he told me that one of the reasons why he came back is since the star system was liberated from the regressive extraterrestrials. He came back at the same moment as the, with the cedars a little bit before, and it was to bring back, to give back to the Earth Alliance the, the template, the uh, frequency key of the, the, the Adamic original DNA uh, to the Earth Alliance. And also, too, I knew that afterwards, that um, to give back Saturn, to the, the the solar system because every so every time before all the Anunnaki the Cedar arrived uh, every time we were passing by Saturn with Thorhan in, in the ship we needed always to avoid Saturn and, and go around and uh, he, he would never tell me why he said there's a secret there there's a big secret there's a big secret okay so 
by year I knew that, I learned that there was um, a technology on Saturn that was very, very uh, powerful and harmful. And this technology was um, Anunnaki and Gray technology, Orion Gray Nebu technology. They had done something uh, put together. So that, that's why nobody needed to know that this powerful technology was there. And also, Saturn was a, a concession of the, the negative faction of the Anunnaki, okay? Marduk and Enlil, they owned Saturn. It was the last stronghold of the Anunnaki in our star system, and nobody had the, the right to go near. It was very delimited. You could go on Saturn's moons, but not uh, pass the inner ring. You couldn't. That was the borderline. Uh, so then um, Marduk and Enlil were defeated. And there was this big council with Anu at the request of the Galactic Alliance, which is composed of the Andromedans, um, the Galactic Federation of Worlds, and other minor organizations, positive, to uh, put an end to uh, Enlil and this trust system, to take him away. And that was after this council that Enki, as an Anunnaki prince, son of Anu, had the right to the custody of Saturn. And then, as soon as he had it, he passed it on to the Earth Alliance. He said, that's it. <laughs> we, I don't want it. I don't want it. It's a sign that now your star system is totally yours. So these agreements to pass the custody of Saturn from uh, Anunnaki power to Earth people, Earth Alliance for the moment, what happened on the moon Mimas. It's the most inner moon. And Mimas is a bit like Ganymede. Uh, it's, uh, there's a lot of um, different ET groups represented there. It, it's, it's a little moon, but inside it's very hollowed. Uh, and it happened there. There was a big council and representatives of Earth. And uh, Ia was there and other ETs involved in the star system. And that's that's when it happened. I do not know the detail of these agreements. I wasn't, um, I didn't have the privilege to, to witness it, um, but um, it, it concerned um, also anything that was Anunnaki related in this star system was just cut ties and given back to earth or destroyed, or that was the end of any ties with the Anunnaki, that was it. So we're talking about two sets of uh, meetings uh, concerning the Anunnaki. The first one, I remember Alex Collier contacting me saying that uh, he had just gotten news from the Andromeda Council that uh, that Anu, the king of the Anunnaki, had been summoned before the uh, before the all the councils to to account or to look into what crimes Enlil had done within our solar system, and that this led to Enlil being brought up and being shown to be kind of like uh, imprisoned or at least um, in some kind of custody, and he was very unhappy. And so that meeting and the outcome of that led to this second set of meetings on Mimas, where or Mimas, where the custody of Saturn and the bases there and the moons were handed over from the Anunnaki to the Earth Alliance. So is, is that correct, that there were yes. two separate meetings um, and different sources have reported on this? And, and you and... Chris O'Connor saw the meeting on Minas, which actually led to the handing over of the Saturn and the moons to the Earth Alliance. Yes, you are very correct, Michael. That's how it happened. Uh, once Enlil was cut from the star system and the custody of Saturn, he, he lost it. Then the custody passed to Enki, and Enki, as soon as he had it, passed it on to the Earth Alliance. And it, this happened on Mimas. While we're on the subject of, of the Anunnaki, 
uh, Ia and Enlil and Anu. Uh, I, I remember one of the pieces of information that you kind of shared some time ago was that the way the Anunnaki maintain longevity is very different to the way it's done amongst the other extraterrestrials, that that other extraterrestrials, you know, they may live for a 1,000, 3,000, or even 10,000 years, but then at the end of that incarnation, they, they simply go through the death and rebirth process where their memories are intact, but they start off in a new body and, and they're living again, whereas the Anunnaki do it by cloning, where they just clone, that they create these cloned bodies that are that have these very long lives but at, towards the end of that life because their cloning is so so good so advanced they're able to just transfer their consciousness from one clone to another so they don't go through the kind of like uh, death and rebirth cycle so you, you want to kind of like just elaborate on that and, and why there is this kind of difference yes um People ask me, but Enki must be very old. It's not possible 400,000 years ago. It's, it's not the same body. And they, the Anunnaki master genetics, absolutely master it. But beyond that, the cedars as well. But what the, the Anunnaki excel in, above the cedars even, it's alchemy. The alchemy of consciousness, the, al the universal alchemy, and they, 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 they know that perfectly, the alchemy of the soul. So they have no problem to jump consciousness from avatar to avatar while in, in the same existence. Um, these giants, bearded giants, uh, you know, when we, we see representations of the Anunnaki in the ancient um, artifacts, and sites, uh, these were avatars because the Anunnaki physiology cannot live on our planet in the conditions of gravity, atmosphere, etc. So they had these avatars that they made even bigger uh, to really impress and be strong and, and, and slave people, you know, etc. Uh, but the, it wasn't them. The, the Anunnaki don't look like these bearded giants. They look like very uh, skinny, tall humans. Well, you have different uh, different species, different races among them. Anyway, they 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 use so they clone their bodies, their original body, the original body. They clone it, and when the clone, it's not a synthetic; it's a biological body. It's not a synthetic body clone. Uh, it's it's a biological clone. It's the copy biological copy of, of themselves. It, it's a biological body. And when it arrives to the end of it, because it's never, um, biology is never eternal, they transfer their consciousness to a new one. And Enki explained to me that to prolongate the biology of a clone, the, the lifespan, because it's not synthetic, to prolongate the lifespan and uh, postpone the degradation and the aging of the, the, the avatar, they use monoatomic gold. And when they are very old and they've been using this monoatomic gold for a very long time, ingesting it and passing it on the body, mixing it with an oil, um, they start to shine. They glow. They glow, they shine. So when you see Anunnaki, with a shiny skin, glittery, a bit like a glitter, um, it's um, it's um, it's monatomic gold that's been used a lot that does that to their genetics. It wouldn't do the same for us, but to their genetics does that. So is that the alchemical process? I mean, uh, I'm just kind of like wanting to get a little bit of clarity on, on how the Anunnaki and how... Ia uses alchemical processes uh, to, to prolong life. I mean, is, is the monatomic gold the, the key part of that alchemic process? Yes, yes, because it's not only about the, the substance, it's a binding the, the, the substance with... Explain to me this type of... 
he employed the term geometry of the soul. It's 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 really strange. Um, I wouldn't be able to explain it very well, you know. Um, <laughs> um, there's there's monatomy gold is the substance. Then it is done playing with frequencies and genetics, you know, genetics of frequencies, and uh, there are encoding that can lock the um, the, the the hydrogen hydrogen bonds and uh, get them stable and really lock them. And that is done with frequencies and frequencies in the, that are also geometry. It's, it's, it's not waves of frequencies, it's patterns, geometrical patterns um, that, that is the shape of the, the frequency. Um, if, I don't know if I can explain it better. Um, Okay, well, I know it's a very complex process. <laughs> I, I, I remember, uh, you know, reading Radu Cinema talking about how um, the cloning, or or at least the 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 creation of uh, of new genetic experiments, involves understanding the significance of celestial bodies. So astrology is a key part of all of that. So yeah, it seems that this is. A, a, a key part of the alchemical process is astro uh, astrology and the position of the heavenly bodies and even artificial bodies like Nibiru could play a role in this. That reminds me that uh, when I asked Ia and Ki, um, when you created, when you man um, engineered uh, um, more activated humans, the planetary matrix, soul matrix of the planet at the time was at a certain type of evolution. How did you manage to get soul of a higher frequency, of a higher evolution to embody these, 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 these people that you, you engineered, these new humans? Um, because it must have come from somewhere else. And he said to me, oh, yes, we are doing that with the position of the stars. And and in another conversation, he said that they're creating pathways through the stars for the journey of the soul to em embody uh, a body. So that's interesting. One of the people we've both interviewed is uh, Mark Domizio, who spent uh, a lot of time uh, at Diego Garcia in, in the Indian Ocean. And, and he, dis he talked about soul splitting, how... His soul was split, in, and an essence, part of the essence of his soul was transferred from his original body into these clones. And then after he was taken back to his original, to his normal timeline, uh, two of his clones contained soul extracts, and one went to Diego Garcia and was there for like 34 years, and the other one went to Mars and he says that one was there for about 38 years. So, you know, what uh, is, is this kind of soul splitting technology, the, the kind of technology that Enlil gave to the deep state? So, no, because uh, this type of technology is unnatural. It's unnatural. It's not um, something that is according to the laws of the universe. And he, as a scientist and alchemist and um, geneticist, uh, he works with the frequency of love, the frequency of source, to be able to uh, create life and engineer bodies. He works in accordance to the laws of the universe and source frequency, which is equivalent to love. He wouldn't harm anyone. He wouldn't do something harmful. Soul splitting is a reptilian, um, draco reptilian technology that is used to, um, yeah, as they did to Mark, uh, sp split someone into different uh, avatars, clones, and use them for whatever reason. Um, that's just very handy. Um, that is unnatural, and all of the fragments suffer. Now that reminds me to my uh, shaman, shamanic training because I trained to be a, become a shaman and I've learned how to do soul retrieval. And that also, that's from now the ancient traditions of, of earth. Uh, 
it is said that when a soul can split when there is a trauma, and especially when you're young, when you are traumatized, a part of your soul can stay embedded somewhere. And a shaman would go and find these pieces of soul and retrieve to the original soul, which is the natural state. So uh, that was interesting. So no, it's not the and then Enki would never have <laughs> done that or given that. That and I know that's a Sikar technology. Okay, yeah, I, I know. I remember Alex Collier talking. He, giving lectures back in the 1990s where he talked about the Dows or the Greys or Orion Greys being able to extract the soul out of children and put them into these small containers and and they would then ship them off and this this was like a slave trade but you're yes. you're, you're trading soul essence is, is that so that sounds like that's that gray technology is probably a hand-me-down from the Drackle? Is, is that what you're saying? So, yes, yeah, so that, that's something different. Um, again, uh, the, the Draco uh, technology is to split soul. They, they do soul scalping as well. But what we were talking about with the clones was a scattering of uh, the soul in different pieces. Now, what we, you, you just mentioned, it's something else. It's soul scalping. That means taking a soul in its globality of a body and putting it in a containers. The Draco do that, Sikar, and the Nebu Tall Greys do that. Um, so they, that's the difference, yes. So while we're on the subject of the Nebu Greys, uh, now you've recently got information that the uh, Ar Orion Queen that is in charge or was in charge of the Nebu Greys has recently died and that the Nebu are now in different states of chaos because some are wanting to rebel, get their independence, and others presumably are trying to fill the power vacuum and that there's a lot of, a lot of chaos in the Orion Grey Empire. So, uh, yeah, what, what do you know about that? Uh, in uh, the, the code of the hive, the super hive, Orion hive, was cracked back in October 2021, if I remember well. Um, and um, yes, so a signal was sent to the hive because they had the Federation had captured tall gray aliens, so uh, the Eban trying to escape and because they had them, they managed to crack the connection to the hive and sent back something, a signal that dismantled the whole, collapsed the whole hive. The queen was a compound of, a creation of a compound of different planetary hive queens. So you can imagine uh, the Orion zone, there's a lot of greys, different civilizations of, of greys. And each, they, they are hive consciousness, most of them, and they have their planetary hive consciousness. Then the, 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 the Eban come and say, oh, let's merge all our queens together to super queen. Then we will all be interfaced and we will be super powerful empire. So they all done that. Um, coerced or not. So this uh, super queen was dismantled and just withered and fell into pieces and now she's non-existent. She was like a big AI, we could say. We could say that to understand it. Now what happened, all the greys were disconnected and there was a moment where they re-merged like the laws of the universe to their planetary hives originally they came back to re-merge their their consciousness to their planetary hives they were a little bit lost for a while but nature the universe did that naturally now um that is just being st stable now that's it but there's a lot going on a lot going on and everyone is extremely busy uh, up there because we need to take care that the planetary hives reforming do it well, that nothing goes to interfere it. And 
like, you know, an enemy coming and trying to take care of these greys who are a bit lost. And that they do not reform to be a potential enemy again, <laughs> also, you know. Uh, because they cannot kill all the greys. It's not how, how they do, you know. Then, yeah, there's this. And also, they're now that, you know, the big tyrant is gone. Well, now there's room for uh, the little thugs and the little um, thieves organizations to to try to to take the, 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 the you know the, the vacuum, the void, and the, the, take the place and take advantage. While all these civilizations that were under the, the slavery of the greys are just whew, you know. Uh, uh, celebrating their freedom and trying to reorganize into uh, let's let's reform a society a government you know uh, all these star systems there's so many star systems that were under the the, the rulership of the orion nebu grays well suddenly they're free but i mean they need to just step go back on their feet and and uh, resettle in a stable government and etc and that takes time and they are fragile and i met with thorhan last night and he told me about all of this that the federation had a tremendous work to do by helping all these star systems to uh, against to defend against the infiltration of new uh, like it would be kind of mafia you know organization this type of of things uh which is i, I understood and yeah that makes sense you know so and now it's the council of five who is in charge of the orion zone so well i remember <laughs> um from the alex collier material uh that i mean he he talked about the earth being seeded by up to 22 different extraterrestrial civilizations. And he said part of the reason for that was that the galactics wanted to see how humanity would, would work out their problems because our problems mirrored the galactics problems at a high level. That in other words, there was a kind of like a hermetic law, you know, as above, so below, that that the earth with all the multiplicity of races and approaches and in and histories and all of that, that mirrored in a way what was happening in the galaxy um and and that's why the galactics were here to kind of you know push their agenda and and try to kind of bring an outcome that they wanted and and so if that's correct and the earth is a microcosm of the bigger galactic equation then it seems that what we have just gone through where the deep state is is has has lost the it's overlords that the negative, the regressive ETs have had to flee, and the deep state is now just the former minions, desperately holding on to power, doing their their final false flag, playing their final false flag cards. You know, with nothing really happening uh, that's going to succeed. That in in a way that mirrors what's happening in the bigger picture in the galactic picture that you've described this orion queen gone and now all of a sudden civilizations all over the galaxy uh, are re reverting back to their kind of like sovereign planetary cultures yes and uh, that reminds me uh, what you're saying michael uh, some some someday una who is part of the cedar races told me oh earth was our greatest experiment so that when she said that she was very exalted, you know, it was our greatest experiment. She was like this. Yeah. And um, it's exactly what's happening. And, you know, what? that's why the Federation is here with the Earth Alliance on Earth really severely holding everything because once the deep state is down, there must not be room for thugs or the thugs organizations you know so it's all well locked then we don't you know we're not in that danger um oh i was told that what happened by thorhan what will happen on on earth with earth with earth and in this star system will be decisive for the whole galaxy 
he knew that from the future. And um, I went, how oh, a little planet uh, halfway near the, the border of the, the arm of the galaxy is going to influence the, the fate of the whole galaxy. I didn't, I couldn't get it until the Eban Greys, the, the, this, um, these Eban Greys were caught and the crack of the, the, the code of the hive was, the Orion hive was cracked. And, and thanks to what happened to in this in our star system, these Ebans who were on Earth in Dulce Bays and who escaped, they were caught. And you know, because of that, it collapsed the Nebu Empire and it affected the whole galaxy. And that's how what happened on Earth saved the whole galaxy. And then I understood it, but I couldn't know before that was going to happen. It's quite remarkable. <laughs> Yeah, it is very interesting how the Earth experiment or multiple experiments were set up for us to be like a microcosm of the macrocosm. And so, yeah, hermetic law it does apply. Um, and what we're witnessing at the moment on Earth and our solar system is, is a mirror for what's happening around the, the galaxy. So I just wanted to kind of like start wrapping it up and, and maybe get your thoughts on space arcs. I mean, any latest information? I know I've, I've had recently had information from uh, JP saying that uh, the, the space arcs uh, are going to start activating or floating after uh, humanity has been prepared, you know, lots of ships being seen. We have Jean-Charles Moyen saying that he was taken to a space arc under Mount Fuji in Japan, and then t teleported to another space arc under Mauna Kea on the big island of Hawaii. So any information you have about space arcs and when they might be activating? Uh, from the, you know, space arcs are from different groups. You have Anunnaki space arcs, you have Cedars, different people, space arcs. You have other, um, species, cultural space arcs as well, but mains are cedars and anunnaki. Um, this technology, it has been activated, but it's at the moment held back until the deep state is harmless or really collapsed. Because if this technology reveals itself, it must not fall in the wrong hands. They're always constantly saying this. So for the moment, it's held back. We are still, um, but they are accessible to people who well, have access like JP, like Jean Charles, um, and they can, they can access them because they have the right DNA and access the technology. Um, that, that's something, you know, the, the we'll go back to our, <laughs> Like a psych, like a circle that we were. I was talking about the, the Freemason at the start. Uh, why they held, why they held all these sites in Egypt because they wanted to have access to a technology that they couldn't start because they never had the right DNA. And it reminds us to um, an evil character on Earth who was working with the Draco reptilians who hunted for tall blonde DNA and certain DNA marker interested by technology and, you know, linked with Antarctica. I don't want to name names here, but I let people, you know, so that's interesting. Okay. Uh, well, just to finish up, I, I know you have some interesting information about Neptune. So do you, Want to give anyone a teaser for for what <laughs> you in, recently encountered and where they can or when they can learn about that? Well, um, I am actually uh, in the process of um, getting more and more information, and I will un unveil the whole thing when I I have all the information because otherwise, you know, it's 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 not great. You need the whole thing. Well, when I was taken on Neptune last year. Uh, by Thoran and his friend Seladion, who works on a mining station in the, the rings of Neptune. Neptune has rings, uh, which was discovered afterwards I went there. That's always excellent. Um, and 
he, they took me uh, through, um, first they took me in, in um, through dimensional, sh kind of dimensional shift, but it was still on Neptune. We were under the ocean, we went under the water on Neptune, and there was an underwater base, and there were people named the Colda Sea, who are also on Jupiter and Venus in the star system. The Colda Sea are a race on their own, and they're not part of the Federation, um, they, they're on their own. They are very mysterious, they are uh, people with green skin and like tentacle hair, big eyes, and they took me, um, They the guy said they want to show you something, they want to, to, to teach you, to show you something. They took me, so the Colda Sea took me through a portal in the base, a big white light. And um, I spent, um, I can, listen Michael, it's, it's the first, uh, I'm saying this here, I spent two months with them and they brought me back. And they showed me, uh, they told me about all the ancient ruins that are in this star system. Um, before the cedars, this star system had visitors that are not involved at all with anything that happened on Earth. So they are out of what we've always been talking about. More ancient visitors. And they told me about these visitors and they linked with the Colda Sea. That's why they're still here. So um, I will bring this information. It, it, it's not linked to the exopolitics current events, so it won't add more uh, information to what we're living, but it's, as an archaeologist, I'm over the moon. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. I mean, I'm very, very interested in that as well, this kind of like a pre-Cedar civilization that existed in our solar system. That'll be amazing to learn about so i know you got a webinar coming up on uh, march 19 so you want to tell us about that this will be your third webinar so you so tell us about what what you think what, what you'll be uh, covering thank you michael well um i um always give the updates of everything um uh, i'm talking about um uh, on, on youtube notably and i go really in deep in depth in depth in depth i will surely speak about giza and the discoveries in Giza and Egyptian archaeology. I will, I'm going to speak about that. I am going to go more in details about pretty much what we've been speaking about tonight. Um, the, the Earth Alliance and um, all these things, um, the Anunnaki and the Cedars. So a lot to cover, but I, I really look forward now to the q a because there will be a dozen one hour and a half q a where i answer people's questions and i chose this because um youtube censors a lot and on crowdcast it's fantastic because i can talk about everything freely and so that that's a great adventure i start to enjoy that and uh as once a month and um yeah, great stuff <laughs> Well, yeah, I highly recommend that to people. Thank so you. Uh, just go to Elena's website, elenadanan.org, so you can find out about her uh, March 19 webinar, uh, which I believe is at 7 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, right? Which Yes. Uh, uh, five, actually, 5 p.m. Yes. 5, 5, 5. p.m. 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Eastern. Time, 2 p.m. Pacific Time. And uh, also, uh, Elena's got. Uh, three books now uh, is there a fourth book on the way and where can people find out about that there's always a book on the way <laughs> never stop <laughs> um the my my three books at the moment a gift from the stars we will never let you down and the cedars are available via my website elenadanan.org slash author and you have all the books and it links with all the sites where you can find them. Um. Well, thank you, Elena. I'm looking forward to your upcoming webinar and all of the incredible uh, updates. And, and, and thank you for sharing all this information uh, to the audience. Thank you, Michael. You have been listening to ExoPolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala. 
please remember to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Join or start a conversation in the comments. Take the time to explore the vast library of best-selling books, webinars, and podcasts by Dr. Sala. Visit exopoliticstoday.com.